Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship. I don't know if my microphone's on, is it? I don't know. (laughs) Well, good morning anyway. I'm just really glad you're here. Welcome to worship here at University Park United Methodist Church on this fifth Sunday in the season of Epiphany. Epiphany is the church season that comes after the season of Christmas. The Christian year begins on the first Sunday of Advent as we take time to await the birth of God's light into the world. Then in this season of Epiphany, the slowly lengthening days of midwinter remind us of the way that God's light can grow in ourselves and and in our world. Every day the sun sets just a little later, the day is a few minutes longer. Epiphany is a season of hope and of promise, and it's my hope that University Park United Methodist Church can be a place that helps us discover how the light of God is growing in our lives. I want to thank Walt Flexer. I don't know if Walt, is Walt here this morning? So I want to thank Walt because he came out here uh, yesterday afternoon right after the snow had stopped and he ran the snowblower over all of our walks and then he was here this morning before 8 o'clock shoveling the, the University Boulevard side entrance to make sure that everybody could get in safely. So really, really grateful to Walt for doing that. If this is your first time worshiping with us or it's your first time in a long time, I want to extend a special welcome to you. If you're joining us online through YouTube or Facebook, we are very glad to have you with us and I hope that soon you'll join us here for worship in our sanctuary in person. University Park United Methodist Church is an open and affirming congregation. Our vision for ministry here is to be an intergenerational, diverse, radically inclusive Christian community where families and individuals can thrive. So whoever you are, whatever you may believe or question or doubt, you are welcome here at University Park United Methodist Church. I'll be in the lobby after worship. If you'd like to know more about the congregation or you just want to say hi, I would love to chat with you. As we begin our time together this morning, please do take just a moment to let us know you're here by jotting down your name on the attendance pads that you'll find in your pews. This helps us know who's at which service, and if you'd like to be on our newsletter mailing list or to receive other communications from the church, you can leave some contact information like your email address as well. Lauren Cowden is our youth ministry director here at U Park, and I want to invite Lauren forward now to tell us about some of what's going on in the life of our church over the next few weeks. But first, I want to invite you to an event that we're beginning next week, and it'll take place on the second Sunday of every month. It's called Discovering U Park UMC. We'll be in the library, we'll serve a light lunch, and this gathering is intended for people who are new to the congregation and who want to know more about our ministry and about our vision, perhaps even inquiring about the possibility of joining the church. So everyone is welcome. If you're new to the congregation and you'd like to know more about us, as I said, we'll be in the library, which is the room adjacent to the sanctuary. We'll serve a light lunch, and I will be looking forward to meeting you and to answering your questions. Lauren? I'm going to go check the amplifier. Good morning. Good morning. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. We have several events happening in the life of our church. First, in addition to our youth ministry, starting this Wednesday, we've created space for a meeting time we're calling Homework in Hangs. Homework in Hangs is a time for the youth to just come be in community or get support on their homework. This is open to all youth. You do not have to be a youth of this church to come and attend. So if you have time on Wednesdays, please do join us for our homework and hangs from 6 to 7.30 in Cornerstone 2. In two weeks, we'll begin to transition into the Lenten season, and University Park does so by celebrating with a huge pancake feast. This feast will take place Tuesday, February 13th, downstairs in East Fellowship Hall at 6 p.m. The youth do their best to cook their pancakes and then serve them to you in addition for a small donation to our youth summer mission trips happening this summer. So if you have time on Tuesday, February 13th, please do join us downstairs for some delicious pancakes starting at 6. And then the following day, which is February 14th, is our Ash Wednesday. We will be celebrating with two worship services. The first one will be at noon, and the second one will be at 7 p.m. Both worship services will take place in Wasser Chapel, and we do hope that you join us for one or both of those services. 
Lastly, we have teamed up with DU Athletics and we have created a time and space for you to get together and go cheer on the DU men's basketball team. Youth tickets are $8. They're welcome to any youth. Doesn't have to be a youth, a part of this church. We'll meet here at University Park at 1.30 on Saturday, February 17th, and we'll walk to the game together. So again, mark your calendars for this fun youth outing event, and we hope to see you there. For more announcements, please do check out the flat screens located in our lobby. You can also check out our website and also our weekly newsletter that comes out every Monday for more information regarding events happening in the life of our church. <laughs> stand as you are able for the call to worship. We seek light, hope, and joy. We bring heart, soul, mind, and body. We share blessings and fears. We bring faith and doubt. With all that we are and all that we have, we gather to worship God. Thanks be to God.
This is 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it, and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. May God bless the hearing and understanding of these words. Let's pray together. Lord God, gathered in your name, we know your presence. We see you in sunlight, in new fallen snow, new moisture soaking into the ground. We see you and know you in our silence that we share, in our song and our worship. And we know that you have gathered us in to speak to each one of us the word you would have us hear. And so may our hearts be open to your words. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So this morning makes the fourth Sunday in this sermon series that I've been preaching, focusing on questions that people have asked me about Christian faith during my time here at U Park, and in fact, during my time at other churches I've served as well. Now, like I've said over the past few weeks, this entire sermon series is really based on two premises, two basic ideas. The first is that questioning and doubt are not the enemy of faith. Questioning and doubt are part of a healthy Christian life. They're part of a vital, vibrant faith. If we take our faith seriously, if we are willing to genuinely wrestle with the teachings of Jesus in the Gospels or the words of, say, the prophets who lived eight centuries before Jesus or the way of life proclaimed by the Apostle Paul, who, as we know, wrote most of the New Testament, then questions are going to come up. They should come up. Because as our spiritual life deepens our experience of God, outgrows our old understandings. This is, I believe, a lifelong process. We never finish it. We never grow into perfect understanding of God. We are always growing toward God and deeper in God. But we can grow closer to God throughout our lives. And asking questions is part of that process. Now, my second premise in this sermon series is that none of the big questions of Christian faith have just one answer. 
we come from Judaism. That's our mother faith. And Judaism was taking shape for more than 1,500 years before Jesus was born. And then since the time of Jesus, we've had another 2,000 years of wise, prayerful people seeking to grow closer to God through the practice of faith. Like I said last week, we are really just the very most recent generation to think about these big questions. People have come up with all kinds of faithful, prayerful Christian answers, and I want to offer you a range of them in the hope that somewhere in here I might say something useful to you in your own spiritual life. So, in the second week of the series, I talked about what it means to say that Jesus died for our sins. It turns out that phrase has been used throughout Christian history to mean at least four different things, probably more, and some Christians don't use it at all. But all of the ways that idea has been understood in our faith do have one thing in common. All of them emphasize that God is willing to sacrifice anything including God's own power, including God's own life, out of love for us, out of the desire to redeem our lives, to bring us closer, to make us part of the holiness and beauty for which we were created. Last week, we looked at the question of whether bad things happening in the world are part of God's punishment for sin. Now, like I said last week, there have been some real heavyweight Christian thinkers who believe that. Augustine, for example, often called St. Augustine, he's one of my heroes, even though I think he's wrong about this, and I think he's wrong about a bunch of other stuff too. But Augustine said, all evil is either sin or punishment for sin. Now, that seems kind of hardcore to me, and I don't believe it myself. I don't think it stands up to basic rational examination. And besides, there are a couple of places in the Gospels where Jesus seems to say very clearly, that's not how God works. But for me, even if you do believe that bad things happening on earth, like COVID, for example, are God's punishment, that is no excuse. It can never be an excuse to judge or condemn others when bad things happen. Our calling as Christians is to show God's glory, to show the compassionate, merciful, loving nature of God by caring for people who are suffering, not by blaming them and talking about how it's all their fault. Today, I want to talk about a question that comes up in lots of different ways whenever I lead a Bible study. And it's true whether we're looking at the creation stories in Genesis or miracles in the Gospels or Paul's adventures planting new churches or the story of the Hebrews escaping slavery in Egypt, people will often ask a question like, is that? And I think that question gets closer to what's really important. Years ago, I had this friend who grew up Jewish, but who, at least while I knew her, was attending worship in a United Methodist church. I don't know that she ever converted to Christianity. She just loved the Gospels, and she loved the community that she found in that little congregation. She was really knowledgeable about Scripture. She wasn't a professional Bible scholar, but she probably could have been. And one day, we were talking, she and I, about this question of whether the Bible is true. And she said, I don't think that we Jews have any problem with the idea that everything in the Bible is true. We're just not sure what it means. See, I've always loved that. I've always loved that approach, and it's it's an approach that I've tried to take towards Scripture. I want to be committed to the idea that there is profound, moving, life-changing truth in Scripture, and part of our job as Christians is to figure out what it means. Anybody here poetry fan, read poetry? I don't read a ton of poetry, but I do love it. And there are poets whose work I find just speaks to me. I don't know why, it just does. The first time I got all the way through to the end of T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets, I was at work. I was sitting in the break room in this job I had in college. I read the final few stanzas there on my lunch break, and it just hit me, and all of a sudden, I was a mess. My lip is quivering, I'm all sniffly, tears are running down my face. I had to go in the bathroom and collect myself. I didn't fully understand everything Eliot was saying, but I knew what he was saying was true. 
And I knew that somehow what he was saying resonated so beautifully with the message of Scripture. Eliot was saying something profound and powerful about how human frailty and all our shortcomings and even our suffering could somehow be redeemed and made whole, not by retreating from the world or escaping it, but by living fully and consciously in it. There's a poem by Eleanor Wilner called The Messenger. It hits me the same way every time. I can't get through it without crying. There are other poets whose work I love, Wendell Berry, G.K. Chesterton, Audre Lorde, Danusha Lamaris, lots of them. To ask whether their writings are factually inerrant is to completely miss the point. It's not even a relevant question. They're just true. They're just true. Writings like that, they speak to our hearts and they change us. Now, I'm not saying that the whole Bible is poetry or metaphor. It's not, although there is some really beautiful poetry and some tremendously powerful metaphor in it. There's also songs and history and ancient religious law and philosophical fiction and religious visions and spiritual teaching stories and sayings to live by and some sayings probably better not to live by. There are letters to little struggling churches. There's all kinds of stuff in there. For me, the really interesting question, the really powerful question, is not whether Jonah really got swallowed by a big fish. I mean, I don't know, maybe he did. But the question is, what does the story tell me about my own spiritual life? What does the story tell me about how I might just be a little too much like Jonah for my own comfort, you know, judging others harsh preferring my own rigid sense of fairness over God's forgiveness and grace and extravagant love? For me, there are two questions that are much, much more important for spiritual life than whether the Bible is factual. The first one is, how is it true? And the second one is, what is it for? What's the Bible for? The author of 2 Timothy, who we heard Suzanne read from this morning, has one wonderful answer to that. Scripture is for all kinds of things, and then summed up at the bottom of the quotation, Scripture is for training in righteousness so that everyone who belongs to God may be equipped for every good work. To be equipped to do every good work in the world, that requires much more than a knowledge of historical facts, and much more than a rigid obedience to a rigid set of rules. To do every good work in the world as we are called to do, that requires inner transformation. That requires encountering those powerful, resonant truths and letting God change us through them. I think of Scripture myself, you may think of it differently, but I think of it as a collection of writings by many authors over the course of more than a thousand years who experienced God and who wanted to pass their experience along. Many of the writings in our Scriptures were handed down by word of mouth around campfires or in little houses late at night for centuries before they were ever written down. All these stories and laws, and sayings, and poems, and songs, and letters, and visions, they are all meant to teach us about who God is, about who we are, and how we can live as God's people. The Bible echoes itself. It argues with itself. It resonates deeply with itself in beautiful and often surprising ways, and it has this time-tested and proven ability to wake us up to God. That stuff is true. That's real. Now, just to be clear, I do think that there are facts in the Bible, no doubt. I think it is a fact that there were a group of people enslaved in Egypt more than 3,000 years ago who left their slavery and became God's people through their desert wanderings. I think it is a fact that there was this Jewish peasant named Jesus of Nazareth who became such a powerful spiritual leader, such a remarkable wisdom teacher, gathered such a following around him that the Roman government colluded with the Jewish temple leadership to make an example of him by executing him publicly in the most brutal and horrific way they could. I think it's a fact that after that Jewish peasant died on the cross, his friends and followers encountered him in the flesh, speaking to them, among them, with them. I think there are lots and lots of other facts in Scripture. But the real question for me is, to what truths 
do these stories point? To what truths about us, about our world, about the kind of community we are called to form together? Now, as far as I am concerned, I mean, I mean this seriously, as far as I'm concerned, you are welcome or not welcome to believe any of these claims of fact that we find in the Bible. You can believe that everything in there is completely factual and without error, or you can take a more skeptical stance. It's fine. But the real question, I think, is the one that my Jewish friend asked. What do these things mean? What do they mean for us? How are they true? And how should I live these teachings to love God, to love neighbor, to be part of God's unfolding story of bringing creation into right and loving and redeemed relationship? Let's take a few moments of silence. saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
this past week, we have, well, past several weeks actually, we have been doing some planning in our church staff meetings for this coming summer. And I'm really excited about some of the things that we have coming up and just to serve as a reminder for you that this church, we, we never shut down and we rarely slow down. This coming, this coming summer, we are planning youth mission trips. We are planning another vacation Bible school that will be reaching out into the neighborhood. We're planning upcoming events, which are not in the summer, but events like our, church, our neighborhood Easter egg hunt and so on. So I just want to underline the fact that when you support the ministry of this church, you're supporting far more than what goes on here on Sunday mornings. This church is a community hub throughout the week. People are in and out of the building constantly, renting the building, using it as space to nurture our surrounding community, and we offer these events to our neighborhood and to our city. So I so appreciate all the ways that you support our church, all the things that you do to make us a better church that can reach out and support and care for the people around us. Thank you so much. Let's have our ushers come forward to take the morning offering. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord God, we live in the midst of your gifts, and every moment truly is a gift from you. So we thank you for this opportunity to return to your use some of what you have given to us, and we ask for your wisdom as we seek to use all that we are and all that we have for the greater glory of your name and your kingdom. We pray all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Let's join in singing our final hymn.
This week, throughout all your days, may you know the truth of God's Spirit resonating within you. May that truth and that light guide you wherever you are, whatever you may be doing. Go in peace.